Namaste and very good morning to all the family. I must thank the Indian, uh, Indian Institute of World Culture for giving me this opportunity to present my paper on secularism and secular values. Last year, on 20th August, we had assembled here and we had spoken about humanism and humanity. And my paper was Back to Humanity and Godliness. Uh, I have again the privilege, although there are many more good speakers who can speak on secularism, but in any way, Mr. Ram Prakash felt that I could present a paper on the subject. Mr. Ram Prakash has dealt in detail about the universality of the religions, about how we all seek the unknown, we are in search of it, and we have brave masters, and we have brave religious books. These teachers, as to how we should reach the great path, the path of universality, the ultimate unknown we have to realize within our own self. He is in every particle of our self. We all know through our science that we have protons and neutrons, and in this we have the cosmic man, the universal man. And if we have to reach the cosmic man and the universal man, we have to seek a path, and this path is totally religious, but it speaks about the greater religion, the religion of humanity, which Dr. Ram Prakash has spoken about, and which I don't have to deal about. But today, in our democratic setup, where we all are citizens, we are equal in our rights, what are what is the role of religion, and what is the role of the politics, how politics have to be dealt with separately, and how religion has to be treated separately. There is total duality in our living, total duality in our mind and heart. And it is the only way, perhaps, we can achieve universal peace. And this was discovered by great philosophers who have seen the revolution which have taken place in Russia, France, UK, with the signing of the Magna Carta. And all the rights, human rights were enshrined in the United Nations Charter of Peace. So it was realized that man should not differ with another man. I, on basis of religion, or on the basis of caste, or on the basis of philosophy, or any of his inner feelings. And you should feel that he is governed by a set of laws which are democratic in nature, which gives freedom to the man, to the equality of the man, to the respect of human beings, to each other. In this regard, I'm, I will deal with the aspect of secularism as a principle, and what the secular values are, and how this secularism and secular values are little different, differently understood in our nation, in our country. As regards the nations which are totally secular in Western countries and in the America. We, there is a lot of difference with the concept of secularism which is understood in our country and how it is understood in the other countries. And there are countries who don't have an iota of secularism as we all know and who have been creating a great non-violent movement throughout the world and they want to have the set of religious rules imposed. And the fountain of that religious movement has started from the Arabian countries. And they want to have religion and their religion as the only source of human peace. And that has practically brought himsa rather than bringing ahimsa, which was it is the uh, thought and principle advocated by the uh, father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, and who fought for the independence with all great men supporting him and the whole nation rose as one in one voice to seek the uh, freedom and after having had the freedom the, the constituent assembly thought it best that the religion will be a great bone in the flesh it will be a great uh, counter to the aspect of freedom for the equality for the respect for human beings and therefore they enshrined in the constitution that we will be a secular socialistic democratic country. So now with this little brief background, I will read my paper to explain as to what secularism means, is and what secular values are and the historical development of secularism and with that we go to see what exactly is the difference in our country so far as the religious laws being implemented is concerned. Then we, I deal with the countering forces to the secularism which is a great threat to the peace and unity of the nation. We need to have a united nation, we need to have a nation free from violence, and so that the ideals of the 
uh, under the directive principle the state policy in Indian constitution is implemented and the principle laid down by the great man that is Mahatma Gandhi is implemented and realized by the nation. So I read the paper Secularism and Secular Values. Secularism is the principle of separation of government institutions and persons mandated to represent the state from religious institution and religious dignitaries. In our country, we respect the religious dignity. We have religious institution. We have better religious institution. But we follow them, we respect them, we go to them, we say our prayers. But we do not want them to have any hold on our political institutions and the way in which we are governed. This is what is the gist of the first paragraph. One manifestation of secularism is the asserting he is asserting the right to be free from religious rule and teachings or in a state declared to be neutral on matters of belief from the imposition by government of religion or religious practices upon the people. This is the example of the Saudi Arabian countries and the Middle East countries who imposed the religious dictates irrespective of the people of their own faith. They, they, they impose their religion, so we do not want to have in the, our secular country or in the secular countries imposition of the religious dictates, religious rules and religious practices on the people and on the governance. Another manifestation of secularism is the view that public activities and decisions, especially political ones, should be uninfluenced by religious beliefs and our practices. How did the secularism thought come into the human life? It is on account of the great Greek philosopher, the Roman philosopher, the Roman rule, and that is brought on in the second paragraph. Secularism draws its influence in intellectual roots from the Greek and the Roman philosophers, such as Epicurus, Marcus, Arius, from enlightened thinkers such as John Locke. Denis Detroit, Voltaire, Baruch Spinoza, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Pine, and from recent free thinkers and atheists. Atheists are those who don't believe in the, the rule of the God, but is the rule of the rationality and rational thinking of man, such as Robert Ingersoll and Bernard Russell. Secularism, secularism means setting up Democratically elected governments and laws passed by parliament and legislatures uninfluenced by the religious dictates and scriptures. The rule of law is supreme and all citizens are equal in the eye of law. The actions are judged by courts, manned by skilled judges, not by fatwas or morvis or by any of the dictates of any of the religious political parties, but it is to be decided by the court of law, by skilled judges, not untrained judges, but skilled judges, and proceedings are conducted with help of trained and skilled lawyers, because they know the nozzles and the different, the, the, the precedents laid down by the great higher courts, and the judges are trained and well equipped with the aspects of law, and they have to run the, help the, assist the courts in delivering the judgment. The government collect tax, direct and indirect from citizens and manufacturers and sellers of goods and provider of services under due process of legislated laws, only in the way in which the law has required the collection of tax, not a pile more, not a pile less. And if it has been collected excess, then it has to be refunded with interest. No person can be punished, censured without due process of law and can be done only after following the principle of natural justice. That is, no man can be condemned and hurt. And he has to be given full opportunity and representation to defend himself. That is the principle of natural justice. He has to be heard in open court. He has to be heard before anything can be said against him. Here, say, evidence cannot be taken into consideration. Solid evidence which has been 
seen, since it has been heard, and it can be tested in the court of law as to the veracity and the correctness of the statements of what the person has witnessed. The state is governed by this constitution and the penal and the contractual laws and the service laws, wherein is enshrined the fundamental rights of its citizens. To the citizens, they are given certain basic fundamental rights of freedom, and they are this freedom of speech, freedom of and certain details of freedom which are enshrined in the constitution and which are upheld by the highest court and the courts of the states that has to be implemented by every citizen and every citizen has this right and it cannot be snatched away by a decree of a mullah or by a dictate of a swami others or anybody they cannot he cannot be removed from the village because he has committed certain offense to the public morality or another he has to be given full rights to defend himself and not by any dictates of the religion this is the basic fundamental aspect of secularism the historical background of secularism is a little required to be seen. India, on gaining independence, adopted secular socialistic democracy with three wings legislature, judiciary, and executive. The Constitution of India enshrined basic fundamental rights to its citizens and all citizens to be treated equally and guaranteeing equal protection with reservation for socially and economic backward classes including scheduled caste and scheduled right for their upliftment and betterment. This is the only difference we have, that we have reservation, which such a reservation is not found in other countries, because all are treated equally means that nobody can be given any special status. But here the country has been for a long time, for ages under the slavery and certain rights have been denied and therefore in order to uplift the persons who have suffered for ages, certain special rights are guaranteed to them. That is the basic difference. People are granted liberty and freedom to practice their faith and religion. Nobody is barred in the country like in communist countries where religion, practice of religion is profit. Liberty and freedom are the foundation stones of the Indian constitution. Now what is a secular society? In studies of religion, modern democracies are generally recognized as a secular. This is due to the near complete freedom of religion. Beliefs on the religion generally are not subject to legal and social sanctions and the lack of authority of religious leaders over political solutions. Nevertheless, religious beliefs are widely considered by most to be relevant part of the political discourse in many of the secular countries, most notably in the Western society the United States. This contract contrasts with other Western countries as Britain and France, where religious references are generally considered out of place in mainstream politics. You must have heard in, read in the today's paper, a lady had gone with a scarf in the meeting of the Prime Minister and she was just asked to do, leave the venue because they strictly believe in democracy, that you cannot have a religious symbol in the public place. You cannot wear your religious burqa or a scarf or a cap and all that. Everyone has to be treated equally means one should not exhibit his inner religious beliefs in a public place or a public institution. This is what is the belief in the UK and the France. The aspirations of secular society could characterize a secular society as one, as follows. One, the secular society refuses to commit itself as a whole to any one view of the nature of universe and the role of man in it. What it means is, we have various philosophies as to the manner in which the man has come into existence. It could be the command of the God be and it has come, or it could be how the Purusha has come, or how the Brahma has come, or Vishnu has come, the Shiva has come and Parvati has come. But the state as a secular state will not lend its support or its findings or its thinking or its philosophy to the various religious beliefs each have and to the existence of the, in the evolution of man and how they have come into existence in the religious point of view. That is the first aspect of a secular society. The second is secular society is homogeneous, is not homogeneous, it is not one as again I refer to you about the Middle Eastern countries but it is pluralistic. We have all our various thinkings, we have various philosophies, we have our own ideals, we have our own way of life, 
own manners of eating, own manners of sleeping, their own manners of the way in which we live our individual, personal life and that is protected in our country and that is known as pluralism where we have our own way to deal our personal life and nobody can tell us how as to we have to live our personal life or how we can prosper in our personal ambitions of life. The secular society is tolerant. It widens the sphere of private decision making. The secular society is why every society must have some common aims which implies there must be agreed on methods of problem solving and a common framework of law. In a secular society these are limited as possible. Then the fifth one of a secular, the feature of a secular society aspiration is problem solving is approached rationally through discussion, to debate, to voting. Through examination of the facts, each aspect of the matter is thoroughly discussed with a committee is appointed at the parliament or a judicial committee is appointed or an expert committee is appointed. They go into the aspect of the each thing which has to be implemented to the people thoroughly and they prepare the report and commission report is placed before the parliament and legislatures and the wisdom of the parliament and the legislature is brought forth and they go into details of it as to whether we have to accept these problem solving method given by these experts and these commissions and thereafter after a great scrutiny a bill is prepared and the bill is brought into subject to public discussion, public discourse, public thought, public views and thereafter it is uh, legislated into a parliamentary act or a legislative act. Without this the problem solving, problem solving cannot be done with a magic wand which is not permitted in a secular society. Secular society is a society without any official images. We have our ideals, we have our ideals, we have our idols, we have our flags, we have our own way in which we respect and give meaning to our way to our philosophies. But an official flag which is recognized by the constitution alone represents the country. It, uh, each one of us cannot have our idol or our thing brought to the public life. This is what is a secular society. It is a society without any official images. Nor is there a common ideal type of behavior with universal application. We can't have our own wisdom thinking that is the last of it. And that wisdom alone should be practiced by everyone and everyone. No, that a secular society does not accept that. To you, to, your, to you, one man's meat is another's poison. You have to only accept that which has been accepted by the nation as a secular nation duly examined by the commissions and by the experts and by the parliament and the legislature and open to public opinion and subject to criticism and thereafter a common view is accepted by the entire nation and that alone forms the method of an official image or it becomes an official view for everyone to accept in a secular society. Now we go to the positive ideals behind the secular society, the next aspect of the paper. The positive ideals behind the secular society is the most basic and fundamental is the respect for the human self, deep respect for individuals and small groups of which they are part and the equality of all people, everyone is equal in the eye of law. Each person should be held to realize their particular excellence and merit. Merit cannot be put down. And anyone and everyone who have to represent the state in the executive, judiciary or in the parliament have to have certain characteristics and certain merits. Everyone cannot have be brought into the state services, but they have to pass through certain stringent tests laid down by the public chair, public legislatures, and only thereafter when they have been scrutinized by men of very high excellence who have been selected for the purpose of selecting men uh, for, to serve the government. Only they can bring and that equality in that selection is maintained and if it has not been maintained, it is the fundamental right of a citizen to the high court, to the highest court of law to seek a writ of mandamus, a writ of, a writ of co warranto, a, and all five types of writs are enshrined which has emerged in the mother of democracy in UK. No man can be heard condemned, no, they, if there is discrimination that can be set aside. And if a person has been arrested or taken into custody without due process of law, he can be asked to be set free. 
And if any institution which has been set up to deliver justice or administration has not been fair and it has applied bias, prejudice and all that, then the, the highest judiciary can set aside such orders and ask for the matter to be reconsidered and re-adjudicated. That is what it does in respect of tribunals if they have not functioned according to the law or if the arbitrary arbitrations have not been done in due process of law then the, any citizen can move the, the courts. We have now, we have also been hearing about public interest litigations. Public interest litigation is anything which affects the interest of public. They, any person who is affected by that or which affects the common cause of any humanity that anyone can take it to the highest court of the country to seek such actions to be curbed, to be stopped and the court intervenes in such matters, taking up as a public interest institution. This is one important feature of a secular society. Then the secular society, in order to achieve the aim of equality and freedom, has to break down the barriers of class, the bourgeois, the higher class, the higher class system of rich people dominating the poor people. All such equality has to be brought there in the class and caste system. It cannot segregate and we are all having equal same type of dress. We don't have uh, religious symbols exhibited. We feel as if we are one. That type of unity among people, unity among the society has to be brought in. And only a secular society can think of bringing a system by which each one of us feel respected. And that respect has to come, emerge not only from inner feelings, inner being, but it, which has been the sole aim of the higher religions. To respect your own self first. Don't degrade yourself. Don't fall in dignity. Don't lower yourself into the eye of humanity. You have to maintain your dignity and uprightness and honesty and integrity. And that everyone helps each other to maintain the dignity of human soul. Human soul is supreme. Human soul is the one wherein dwells the divine light. And this divine light has to be realized. And that is what is the main aim of any secular society and that of the any grand great religions. Now we come to see how a little principles of basic secularistic philosophies which I mentioned initiated or uh, it came up in the Greek philosophy, in democratic societies, in Roman philosophy was slightly modified and differed in so far as a country is concerned because this country is a great civilization, a civilization which has existed from centuries and it has given birth to great religions and it has given place for all the religions of the world to come and reside and live peacefully. Ahimsa has been the great pillar of the Indian civilization and this Ahimsa has to be retained, the Swaraj has to be retained, the dignity of man has to be retained and for this purpose the secularism in India is little, little different and perhaps the times may come when the institutions like this will float the true value of secularism in the parts of the country, in each individual and slowly this country can become more and more secular. The, sec the aspect of secularism at the time in India in attained independence and with that what we are after 70 years is a lot of difference. It is not so. What it was in 47 was still we were under hold of slavery. Today it is not so. Every individual is free. We have a free internet, we have free newspapers, we have free education. And education is spread in the length and breadth of the country. And anyone and everyone can enter any temple without any restriction. They have freedom of religion. So this is one great aspect of Indian life. Secularism in India means equal treatment of all religions by the state. This is the difference. All religions are treated equally. It is not so in respect of non-secular states. In non-secular state, only the religion which has been adopted by their country rules and whatever the dictates given by the fatwas given by the religious heads, that stand, there is no freedom for discussion, there is no criticism, there is no dignity of man, there is no equality of man. That is the difference wherein in our country we respect all religions and we treat all religions equally. The laws, the Indian laws implicitly require, inherently, in the, in the very nature of the Indian laws is that it requires the state and its institutions to recognize and accept all religions. 
enforce parliamentary laws instead of religious laws and accept pluralism. India does not have an official state religion, although the majority of the, the people and citizens of India have one particular religion as their faith, one religious book as their faith. But the, the greatness of the Indian parliament, the parliament which ensured quoted the constitution not to accept the one book but to accept all the books as equal for the purpose of implementation of the religious code to respective religions. But so far as the secular laws are concerned, it respects all citizens and only secular laws will be implemented. This is the difference in the Indian constitution and the constitution of the other countries. The people of India have freedom of religion. Nobody can stop me from praying in the way I like, my religious gathering, my religious processions, my religious dogmas, my religious taboos, all these things, it is your individual aspect. You may, but all those religious laws should not oppose the public policy. It should not be against the public policy and human dignity. If it is opposed to the human dignity and human values, basically, then the laws can be passed, can be enshrined, can be can be passed to restrict such type of a practice. There were a lot of practices in India where certain class practices were 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 done, like sati or various other type of which was against the annual manual scavenging. These were all against the human dignity of man, and the parliament has. Uh, interfere and stop, although it may be a great dogma for a certain type of people to practice that. The people of India have freedom of religion and the state treats all individuals as equal citizens regardless of the religion. In matters of law in modern India, however, the applicable code of law is unequal, unfortunately. It will take time. I will come to it as to how the religious or is little certain protection is little more to certain certain minorities compared to what it is to the majorities, which is one aspect of the Indian constitution. However, the applicable code of law is unequal and India's personal laws on matters such as marriage, divorce, inheritance, alimony varies with individual religions. Now, the, there is a clamor for bringing in common civil code. There is a lot of intricate details in each personal religions and religious codes. In certain South Indian communities, the uncle can marry a niece, but it is a prohibited degree among the, the uh, other religions, uh, Christians, Jews and Mohammedans. They cannot marry the sister's daughter. And in respect of the Hindu law, one can give away the entire property by a will. A will can be returned and changed any number of times before death. It can be a written will or an unwritten will, even in a small piece of paper it has written that will or write a registered will. Now, in respect of Mohammedan law, wills cannot be executed and the strength of the will of these only one third. Whatever the person has tested or has decreed in his will, it will have only effect of one third. The rest of it will go in the way in which it is it has to be distributed. Then the redistribution is not partial. It is not impartial, it is partial. The mother gets one sixth share, the sons get two shares, and the daughter gets one share. While in respect of Hindu law, which has been enunciated in the from the parliamentary law, Hindu law of inheritance which have been promulgated, the daughters and sons get equal share. So likewise, in the various religious practices of worship, in the way in which we live and all those things, the practices are different. So this is all a common code has to be done means only when each one of the community elevates itself and raises itself above the show, head and shoulder and they feel that they are equal in each one of them and they, want, they decide that we'll have a common school. Yes, if it is a consanguous marriage is bad in science between a sister um, and a brother, so also between a niece and a uncle. Likewise, the among the uh, Mohammedans, cousins marry. It is not so in the Hindu law. They have to be seven gotras away. Only then they can marry. They have to see the gotras even in respect of a high class people. If they are from a same gotra, they don't marry at all. Not only because the Hindu joint family exists. Now certain privileges have been given to the Hindu joint family, which are not there to the other 
people in the country. So, because Hindu joint family is considered as a partnership, and they are to, the, the partnership act applies to them. So, likewise, there are so much differences in the personal laws. It is difficult to bring a common civil code, and hence, the in, in respect of these matters, the the code of law, personal code of law, is protected, and they have been given to practice with slow modifications and slow methods of. Uh, reformation being brought in. One aspect which requires immediate attention and, and uh, uh, reformation is with regard to the divorce. The Mohammedan law is very lax. It considers marriage as a simple contract and you can just severe a contract by paying alimony or damages and that's the end of it. And it can be done in any manner, in a quixotic manner, in a manner which is not about it is uh, common or rational or to, it is totally illogical. If husband feels he is unhappy because the tea has not been properly prepared, he just pronounces three times, cannot understand it. But it is not so in case of Hindu law. It has to go to the court of law under the Hindu marriage act. They have to file and they have to give reasons as dictated and laid down in the Hindu marriage act. Only in case if they have agreed by a common understanding to severe or dissolve the marriage, only then the marriage can be, or that is only after one year of marriage, they can file a petition for separation and for divorce. So slow evolution is why it was not so. Marriage was considered as sacred in the Hindu law. When it was a sacred question of divorce did not arise. But the parliament felt that it is a great burden on a family which does not want to exist. A person who has been totally without a child would like to have adopted child. There are so many various reasons that the, the differences may be irre, the, the differences may be irretrievable. They cannot reconcile. So that's why the parliament passed the law in the Hindu law to separate and divorce. But only on being the court being satisfied. Unfortunately, you know the laxity in the courts, the difficulty in getting. As of today, there are thousands of petitions lying in the value of metropolitan court with regard to the Hindus and others asking for divorce. They have seven, there were only one court 30 years back with few petitions of divorce. Today, there are thousands of petitions with nearly about seven or eight courts having been manned with this power only as matrimonial courts. So, we have to find solutions, and these solutions can be only through public opinion and by going into rationality, by discussing in the forums and in the legislature. This is what is the main of secular society is. Secularism as practiced in India, with its marked differences in Western practice of secularism, is a controversial topic in India. Supporters of the Indian concept of secularism claim it respects Muslim men's religious rights and recognizes that they are culturally different from the Indians of other religions. This is a great area of dispute and controversy. Secularism is a divisive, politically charged topic in India. Secularism in India thus does not mean separation of religion from state. Instead, Secularism in India means that a state is neutral to all religious groups. Religious laws in personal domain, particularly for Muslim Indians, supersede parliamentary laws in India. And currently in some situations, the state partially finances certain religious schools. It uh, protects the temples, mats, um, dargahs. So there are various bodies have been created. Work board has been created, these uh, temples have been protected and they have uh, placed certain administrative officers of the, the Indian civil service to manage the funds of uh, high big religious trust. Secular values, what are secular values? This is the most important topic of the secularism. Secular mind is better equipped than religion, religious mind. To reach reason and compassionate judgment. The reason is the religious dogmas which are filled in our heart and mind does not free us to take a rational, a completely unprejudicial and a clear, crystal clear thinking and thought. It will be totally opposed to the personal views I may be having. So that is why a secular mind, mind if it is a secular mind, it is totally scientific. It is rational. It is humanistic. Humanistic. Totally human. Religious mind tends to become irrational. 
and fanatical leading to inter-religious differences, violence and bloodshed. The more potent form of faith seeks to justify doctrines and practices that defy rationality and compassion. Religious minded refuse abortion even in a case of rape, incest or severe fetal abnormality. The church has not yet recognized as a to for giving permission for abortion. It may be an incest and it is not good to have a child of your own child through your daughter. But it doesn't interfere, it's a law of our faith does not require the killing of the child in the womb. So while a secular mind says, no, there is a lot of fetal abnormality, you cannot have, and rationality applies and the parliament interferes. Secular mind, on the other hand, value human rights and makes the society tolerant. Therefore, secular values are simply those values derived not from any religious source, separate from any religious concerns, all stemming from secular meaning not connected to any dogma or doctrines. Anything said to be secular includes values is that which has been reached through purely human means. When we religion formally we all feel there is something which is great, which is unknown, which is somewhere from the uh, known heaven or from there he has uh, transmitted the laws to us to follow. I am my father in the heaven is same. The God and man is same. And whatever I say is the word of God. So the human element has made human laws are made into God laws, divine laws. He, which the secular laws does not accept. It says no, it has to go to the test of mind and rationality. Scientific temper has to be developed. Secular values are those values which people come up with that focus on this effect certain actions actually have on people, other organisms, plants, etc. Instead of ignoring overriding such concerns to focus on the commands of some religious text, traditions or whatever. Secular values are derived from rationality and based scientific findings than superstitious beliefs or religious dogmas. Secular humanism is a comprehensive lifestyle for whole, for whole life we take that from birth to death that is the feelings that is the view secular humanism now we come to what humanism is also our world view embraces human reason metaphysics naturalism altruist morality and distributive justice and consciously with consciously we take we know what we are taking the decision reject supernatural claims theistic faith and religiosity pseudo science and superstitions this is secular humanism it is sometimes referred to as humanism humanism is a democratic and ethical lifestyle which affirms that human beings have right and responsibility to give meaning and shape to their own lives Somebody else cannot decide my life, which is on superstitious belief I am not supposed to do um, or do what the superstition requires me to do. It is urgent, a, man, a child is uh, had a fracture or a person is uh, having a heart attack and he has to be moved to the hospital by ambulance. You can't look into it and say, no, this is Bulikala, this is Rahukala, let the Rahukala pass, the mind will die. So that type of superstitious thought should not come in the way of urgent, human, emergent, aspects of human life. That is what it, uh, the humanism deals like. Don't bring superstition when it comes to the human life itself. Humanism is a democratic and, an eth and ethical life stance which has affirms that human beings have right and responsibility to give meaning and shape to their own lives. It stands for the building of a more humane society through an ethic based on human and other na natural values in the spirit of reason and free inquiry through human capabilities. It is not theistic based on the God or God's command or divine laws and does not accept supernatural views of reality. This is the definition given by International Humanistic and Ethical Union. 
They have formed the ethical union, humanistic union, and they have force. This is what. Uh, now, and the most important aspect is how to protect our secular society. We are seeing a lot of fascistic thoughts, fascist, fascism, fundamentalism growing in our society, which is threatens the very foundation of secularism. So, in this regard, certain suggestions which are in the public forum, in the public debates, I have brought out so that we can contemplate and think about it. I just go and read because the time is up. In a parliamentary democracy, the majority party holds the reign of the government. Where a party having strong religious leaning with religious ideals as their agenda, then their functioning and rule is bound to affect the ideals and values of secularism. This has been demonstrated in our country with umpteen communal rights and separation of rights of minorities, tribal caste, tribes, and backward classes. Recent excesses shown in the enforcement of ban on cow slaughter is one point. Ram Temple issue also brought in series of communal clashes and affected the harmony and peace of the country. The question facing the country is how to strengthen secularism and secular values by facing the challenges posed by fascism and fanatism. The old Indian spiritual life and custom has been replaced by Western modes and Western way of life. The two great world wars had a little impact on our country. Instead, it stirred political consciousness among the masses, which played a great part in bringing the change in the lifestyle of Indian people. The traditional caste system and the hold of upper classes have been broken, and a more cohesive society has been created. The social revival of the masses with the assuring in of right of self-determination, rule of law, and concept of social welfare has indeed shaken the tradition, traditional faction tradition caste society. The improvement of social lives of poor masses, shadulkas and tribes by enforcement of democracy into the hitherto highly religious society has brought in tremendous changes in the social lifestyle of Indian people. So economic changes and the changes of the village life pattern to a more sophisticated urban life have equally not been free from malaise. The emergence of evils of western civilizations like poverty, crime, prostitution, alcoholism, juvenile delinquency, gambling, beggary, materialism, consumerism, dissolution of joint family, divorce and breakdown of traditional social life has helped in the growth of religious fanatism. At one hand, the concept of state and involvement of people in their state affairs has become total, but on the other hand, the waning of spiritual life has also become apparent. The growth of materialistic lifestyle, high cost of living, and the inability of political parties to solve these issues and help in the development of socialistic philosophy and democratic lifestyle has thereby created a watershed in the Indian polity. This has been the major cause of the revival of religious fanaticism. Even before the concept of free thought and expression and democratic living could become a way of life for the last Indian, the religious forces have revived, thereby affecting social values and secular values in secularism. Though these social religious forces are more from persons who are pseudo-spiritualist and god -men. The two religious guides and philosophers of India who have mass influence have become scarce and rare. This has given room to, for fascist forces to grow in leaps and bounds, endangering secularism and secular values among the Indian people. The greatest harm the fascist, fundamentalist and religious politicians have done is to run down the supremacy of rule of law and to weaken the functioning of the democratic institution beside causing the destruction to the growth of true spiritualism. The answer lays in the search to bring in cohesion between the philosophies of the ancient spiritual sages with those of present concept of rule of law. The way to counter fascism and strengthen secularism and secular values is to meet these challenges posed by materialism and consumerism. It is by reviving true spiritualism in the Indian religious context rather than use of ritualistic symbols, religious rites in all secular democratic institutions. Use of religion in politics should not be allowed. Political parties should not be allowed to use any religious rites or symbols. All religious processions in public places 
should be discouraged. Democratic leaning and only true spiritualists should be encouraged to give the message of brotherhood, humanism, compassion and mercy. The sacred spaces in India where people practicing their respective religions gather to celebrate common festivals are required to be strengthened to help secularism and secular values. So also secular values have to be strengthened in all public schools, public institutions and public places. Thank you very much for your patience here. Thanks. Uh, the subject matter as which Delphi has given was uh, extremely excellent and uh, it's very appealing to everybody. So, on behalf of all of us and also on behalf of the Institute of World Culture, I thank you very much. And uh, the discussions will be later, we will take up the discussions because we will uh, achieve the session for the coffee and we will be back at 12.15 exactly. We will start exactly at 12.15. Yeah, I see it,